Thank you very much, Ken, for the nice introduction. And thank you, Bill. Thanks to the last for having me here. And thanks to you all. I, I know that this is a tough week because we're almost like in vacation mode. So thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Venezuela today and about opposition dynamics, opposition politics. I want to very briefly tell you how I got to work on this topic. I sometimes like it when people tell a personal story of why they work on these issues. Uh, when I started doing my master's in Oxford back in 2013, I, w I was interested in understanding what had happened uh, to opposition parties after Chavismo came, came into power. So we see 40 years of more or less stable um, democracy with its flaws, but um, democratic procedures are in place. So two big parties, Acción Democrática and Copay, alter the presidency in a bipartisan system. And then we see party system collapse. Um, by the end or mid 1990s, and we see the emergence of um, anti establishment candidate um, Chavez to power. He wins in 1998. And I was interested in finding out okay, what ha has happened to opposition parties ever since? So it was 2013 um, and 2013. So after the second um, presidential election, where the opposition in 2013 narrowed the gap to Chavismo by 1.5%. I was wondering, okay, how can we explain that? It seemed to me that they were really weak during all this time, um, up until 2013. So I went there um, for my first uh, field work in 2014, and I was asking, you know, about weakness and why is it? So I was thinking it was uh, their lacking program or lacking strategies that didn't make them uh, be more competitive. Something I hadn't uh, taken into account was the regime change that I'm kind of um, showing here. So. With the emergence of Chavismo, step by step, we see gradu gradually the erosion of democracy and the rise of an electoral autocratic regime. And that pattern was coming up in my interviews a lot. And so I got to um, study more during my MPhil, how is it that opposition parties become stronger in competitive authoritarian regimes or electoral authoritarian regimes? And the mechanism there was coordination. When I move on to the DPhil, uh, I noticed that the literature doesn't talk very much um, as of yet, when opposition parties coordinate and when they don't. So I moved on to that puzzle. So let's set the scenery for the next um, 40 minutes. Um, I'm going to show you now the PhD motivation. So it seems to, um, there seems to be a um, consensus around the fact that the opposition needs to be united in Venezuela to be able to win elections. Here we have uh, Luis Ortega, she's a regime defector, former general attorney. She was um, with Chavismo between 2007 and 2017. Um, and she said during an interview, she said, all Venezuelans have to unite to oust the dictator. Here we have current speaker of the National Assembly, Julio Borges, um, and he says the following um, earlier this year. There is one essential point, and it is the issue of our coalition. If we're unable to rebuild, relaunch, or strengthen not only our unity, but the Venezuelan society as a whole, we will not be able to reverse the situation. So again, strengthening the need for unity. Freddy Arrida, um, currently vice um, speaker of the National Assembly, says the following in August this year. We cannot allow the regime to divide us. If we're divided, we're only doing them a favor. We're stronger together, and this is how we're going to oust the regime. So there's a huge inter-party consensus that unity is important. And some headlines say, ah, la oposición está más, no, más unida que nunca. So the opposition is the, the most united it has ever been. This is the earlier this year. At the same time, just a week, few weeks ago, we see a Venezuelan opposition faces divisions after elections. In July this year, the coalition, which is called Mesa Unidad Democrática, the MUD presented a governance agreement um, for the post-transition period. And a few weeks ago, this was uh, the front page uh, of El Nacional, one of Venezuela's most important um, uh, newspaper, Murió la Mood, so did the coalition die? This also leads me to my research question, which, which is, what explains opposition coordination in electoral autocracies? How can we explain fragmentation or coordination at times? So let me very briefly um, walk you through um, a couple of existing explanations and I'll tell you in, contra in contrast what I'm doing. Access to private capital was um, considered by Arola one of the uh, most important uh, factors that explains when opposition parties decide to coordinate or not. Or not. He's looking uh, mostly at African uh, parties and, and says that 
when opposition parties, especially um, the most important, biggest um, opposition parties have access to private capital, they'll be able to buy off or buy um, smaller um, coalition um, members and guarantee them some sort of benefits. So this will make coordination more likely. Regime weakness. So when the regime is perceived to be weak, um, coalitions will more likely um, to occur. Divide and conquer strategies will make opposition party coordination more difficult. That is, when the regime is capable of deploying coercion or cooptation strategies, that is, buying off um, opposition par parties by offering um, political offices or economic incentives, coordination is less likely to happen. And then finally, we also have ideology, that is, when um, opposition parties are on two uh, ideological extremes, it will make coordination more difficult. This is what argues Magali and, and Green also in, in their book on Mexico. Now, in contrast, I suggest to look at the nature of the regime. So electoral autocracies vary a lot, and we sometimes put them up all together. It is important, I think, to consider whether a regime is more on the authoritarian end or on the democratic end, because the incentives for, co for coalition building will be very, very different. So I'm suggesting to look at the politics of repression. How repressive is a regime that will also dictate whether opposition parties will assume the costs of coalition building or not, or coordinating in a broader sense? Um, and I also look at opposition par um, parties, uh, formation, strategy formation, I'm sorry, and decision-making processes. So I'm going to walk you um, through my main um, theoretical argument over the next couple of minutes. And first, I want to start off with defining my two um, concepts, the most important ones, which is repression and coordination. As I said before, electoral autocracies are very different, they vary a lot, and um, there has been lots of literature arguing you know, whether a regime is competitive authoritarian, fully authoritarian, electoral authoritarian, hegemonic authoritarian, electoral authoritarianism, electoral um, autocracies. There are lots of um, definitions going on, but I believe a more efficient way of maybe um, making differences between all of these regimes is by looking at the levels of repression. So on a scale between democracy and authoritarianism, how, or let's say electoral democracy or a weak authoritarian regime and on the other end a full dictatorship, there is a huge variance and I think we need to take that into account. That means that repression varies, as I said, there are different degrees and a different repertoire. So let's think of this as a, as a toolkit. Dictators or autocrats may use different in, um, ways of repressing their opponents. I suggest to look at, particularly um, in electoral autocracies, to look at institutions and violence, both as dimensions of uh, repression. Why? Well, particularly because these type of hybrid regimes use institutions um, to maintain themselves in power, but also to legitimize their government. That is, while they have all these democratic institutions, their um, exercise of power is authoritarian. So I do believe that institutions um, are a key mechanism to um, deliberately disadvantage uh, opposition parties to participate, to effectively participate in um, electoral processes. And then on the other side, which is the classical uh, notion of, um, of repression, which is violence. And let me maybe just give you a couple of examples here, what I mean um, by institutions. So parliament, for instance, can pass authoritarian laws, which could curtail, let's say, um, the access of opposition parties to media, uh, which means that they'll be less likely to uh, achieve um, you know, all voters or uh, get to them, get their message across. The judiciary, um, as I will also uh, show in the Venezuelan case, can also be a key institution in legalizing autocracy. And EMB means electoral management body. Um, so by controlling uh, the electoral authority, the regime could get away with uh, fraudulent or uneven and unfair um, electoral processes. Second concept, opposition coordination. So I understand coordination as a process, not a linear process, and it may vary uh, from context to context, but what is important here is that opposition parties are working towards a shared goal. In my thesis, I'm only interested in parties that are looking um, to oust the regime. Opposition parties can have different incentives in, in electoral autocracies. They're all not the same. Uh, some can be uh, you know, co-opted, some 
might want to coexist with the regime. There's some others that really want to win office, and that's the one, uh, the ones that I'm looking at. So I think then again, coordination can be maybe split in two um, dimensions, a formal and an informal one. By informal, I mean kind of private agreements where opposition parties or opposition leaders come together and discuss the possibilities of you know, uh, challenging the autocrat together, or they might just think about how they want to approach politics, but it's nothing institutionalized. It's, nothing is um, really formal written down. There is no agreement, formalized agreement. On the formal end, um, we have an institutionalized process. And I'm thinking that there, broadly, there can be four sub-dimensions of a uh, formal coordination process, including the formation of an electoral coalition, um, the process of candidate selection, joint candidates, of course, uh, the formation of a common policy platform, and also coming up with joint uh, mobilization strategies. So here, when um, there is a formal uh, coordination process, opposition parties will institutionalize and make to the voters clear that they have decided to come together to challenge the regime jointly. Okay, so let me um, now move to the main, main argument of the thesis. I'm arguing that there um, there is a there is a curvilinear relationship between repression and uh, the probability of opposition coordination. There is similar literature in the social movement um, sector that argues that repression has also an inverted U shape um, relationship with uh, protests or the likelihood of protests. I'm kind of thinking that that could apply also to the logic of um, opposition parties in authoritarian contexts. So this is what I'm what I'm thinking. Mainly, we could have we can have a um, space where there is no repression, intermediate repression, and high repression. In those three scenarios, A, B, and C, we'll see different incentives for opposition parties to coordinate. Are we all on board? If you have any questions, just uh, let me know. So let's walk through A, B, and C. So what's going on in E? In A. Here, parties will think about their individual rewards. Why? Well, because there are still enough resources to campaign. Access to media might be guaranteed. There's maybe access to uh, public funding. Um, all institutions might not be controlled yet by the, by the government, so maybe they do have access, say, to the electoral management body to uh, claim if there was fraud or uh, the judiciary is not completely biased. So parties here will care about their individual rewards, their relative gains, not only to incumbents, but also to other opposition parties, because they can win. And so they would prefer to win them a, a governorship or a local, a local government, or even aspire for um, the executive office. Now, this logic changes as we move up to uh, the uh, scenario B. So repression goes up, and the coordination, the incentives for coordination will go up as well. Why? Because resources are becoming now fewer. So again, let's walk through the same kind of um, examples. Maybe the access to media is restricted now, or um, institutions are more and more being controlled. Maybe there were purges in the judiciary or in other important institutions. So the access of opposition parties to these institutions um, are, um, reduced and maybe these institutions are already acting in a repressive way so they're targeting opposition parties they're disqualifying um, opposition candidates from effectively participating um, maybe they also uh, this, the, the government has cut funding for opposition parties so we're in a context where competing already becomes um, more problematic and that's why in this context opposition parties will give up not completely give up but um, subordinate their um, individual rewards thinking uh, to the absolute kind of gains logic. So here they'll care about the um, uh, collective rewards of the opposition as a whole, um, which is why they will be induced uh, to cooperate. And there's mainly two reasons. A, survival becomes an issue, and B, they've also noticed that it is only through a coalition maybe or a coordination agreement that they'll be more likely to win. Now, as we move towards C, that is, we're moving towards a full dictatorship uh, as repression is going up. I argue that the same logic that was in place in A will kind of reappear 
and see for different reasons. Now competition is maybe not even possible anymore. The regime might, might have banned parties or is increasing the cost of uh, coordination even more uh, or participating in elections, I'm sorry. Uh, elections are not even taking place anymore, maybe. And so now leaders and parties will think about their individual situation. So personal safety becomes an issue. And when that is the case, um, coordination or institutionalized coordination, the, one, the ones that I'm looking at, doesn't make sense anymore. I'm not saying that there will be no op opposition whatsoever. But what I'm saying is that the type of coordination that we could see here will no longer be possible here. So very briefly, um, today I want to talk about my case um, on Venezuela uh, only. Why is this a useful case? Well, Venezuela transitions over the past 18 years through um, all three scenarios, A, B, and C. It becomes, it starts being a low repressive regime, moves towards kind of intermediate repression, and since probably last year, um, we have transitioned to a dictatorship according to many. Um, how do I substantiate my case study? Well, I've been to Venezuela four times, 2014, and I was there um, two weeks ago. Last time, I have uh, over 80 interviews with opposition elites, uh, journalists, academics, also exiled politicians out in the U.S., but also some in Europe. Um, I only have a few with incumbents. It's, it's very hard to get access to them, A, and also for personal reasons. Um, it's not... It's not that easy to, to talk to them and to track um, the movement and repression that I'm using uh, VDEM data. Okay, so let's move on to the case. This is how institutional engineering or institutional repression looks like in Venezuela under Chavismo. So this is, this is the democratic period um, before. We start here in 98 and we see dramatic, dramatically a, a drop in the in indicators that I'm bringing here. These are just examples. I just want you to get a sense of what I mean by institutional repression. So let's start with blue. Blue is electoral management body autonomy. So this shows us that basically the autonomy is gone. So it's a biased um, institution. It's not independent anymore. Uh, orange is the high court independence drop massively as well. So it was purged uh, several times and now it's packed with pro-regime um, judges. In gray, I hope you can see that here, um, is media self-censorship. So um, that has increased. Um, so media, the media now is self-censoring because they expect fines and um, in general freedom of expression has, has dropped. And then finally we have in yellow, public campaign finance, or as we see, the opposition does not have access to any public funds. So these are examples of physical coercion. Um, again, in blue, we see freedom for political killings. So this is how VDEM formulates and, uh, th this indicator. So basically what we see is that um, political killings have um, increased or there is no freedom from political killings. In orange, we see torture um, has increased. And in gray, the barriers to parties, that's a combined index that looks at intimidation, harassment um, of opposition parties. Okay, so let me walk you through the last 17 years. Um, bear with me. I'm going to try and unpack it all under the next um, 20 minutes or so that I think I still have. Okay, 1998 to 2006. This is a context of party system collapse, anti-establishment sentiment and of other actors playing into opposition politics. So I'm not claiming that it's only the repressive um, context that uh, dictates why opposition parties don't coordinate. This is important because um, party systems, and, and Ken is, uh, is the reference there, because of party system collapse, um, parties were very discredited, right? Nobody really believed in them. And that's why also other factors, other powers like media, civil society, and the private sector could push the political agenda um, towards other short-term strategies, as we will see. But additional, additionally to this uh, kind of context, we also observe that repression is low. That is, during the first couple of years, actually, Chavismo doesn't advance uh, towards an authoritarian agenda. So institutions are not completely controlled yet. We don't see massive purchase as of yet of the judiciary. We don't see um, as of yet a packing um, of the electoral management body. The media is still operating um, 
as previously. So the consequence is that we have no incentives for coordination during this time. So what happens during this time? And I, I brought a couple of quotes um, from my interviews to share with you how politicians thought about each of the each of the contexts that I'm going to talk about. So this is a member from Acción Democrática, and he said in 2015, it was neither a full democracy or a full autocracy. It was just the beginning of something we did not understand at the time. Similarly, Tamara Adrián, uh, who's the current uh, MUD MP, says, we didn't know what we were up against. We didn't have a definition at that time. We didn't know what kind of monster the regime was going to turn into. So clearly here, there is a... Um, uncertainty as to where the regime is going. There are some signals that it might go in, a, in an authoritarian direction, but there is no effective way of measuring it yet. So what we see during this time is the emergence of a loose platform for some sort of coordination, which is called La Coordinadora Democrática. So this uh, kind of alliance, um, which is uh, made up by parties and other powers, as I mentioned, civil society, private sector, and the media kind of comes around the table to sit down and discuss, well, how are we going to get rid of this, uh, of this regime? And this is where uh, lots of variation in strategies happen. So we see a general strike and a coup in 2002, a recall referendum in 2004, and the abstention from the parliamentary election in 2005. One, all, well, actually, all of these... Um, strategies were put forward by different sectors of the agenda. So we don't see coherence or coordination around the actions of the opposition bloc to confront Chavismo. But this will only emerge later on. So after the abstention from the 2005 election, the parliament went to Chavismo only. So it was only controlled by the regime party. And after this context and after this trigger, let me just go back one second. The opposition thought that if they did not go to the polls, um, it will delegitimize de uh, Chavismo. So they thought, oh, the international community is going to do something about this because clearly this is no dem not democratic. That didn't happen. So that meant that Chavismo had for five years a controlled parliament where they could pass whatever they wanted to, right? So after this um, happening, this is Manuel Rosales, and he says the following. Not participating in the 2005 election was very costly. After that, there was no opposition over oversight and no equilibrium in the parliament anymore. So here they notice we have to come up with something else. They're going to advance um, in a direction that we don't want to. So we have the first kind of incentive um, for coordination after this um, after this um, after the 2005 election and Manuel Rosales. Told, told me the following just a couple of weeks ago. By 2006, Chavez was already using all state powers and all state mechanisms when campaigning. In Venezuela, there was no rule of law, no checks and balances, no equal participation for the opposition. We knew that divided, we would have never had a chance, which is why we understood, understood the need to act united. So, it is the parliament that triggers this kind of thinking, and it's also, I forgot to mention that, in um, the RICO referendum was delayed for more than one and a half years uh, for Chavismo to recover. When the opposition initiated the process, it was late 2002, and it only took place in 2004. So these subtle mechanisms, right? I mean, we could think, well, it's democratic. I mean, he went to the referendum. Yeah, but it's detected before that. It's the clientelism before that. It's the manipulation of the electoral calendar that made him win in the first place. So these events made the opposition think about um, the need of coming up with a different strategy and a different alliance. This is Luis Emilio Rondon. Uh, he was the head of UNETE back then when, when we talked uh, in 2005 and he said the following. Looking back, we can say that Manuel's campaign was his campaign. It wasn't a unitary campaign in the sense that other opposition parties didn't have much to say about it, say about how to run it. And then he says, that changed for Capriles. He was no longer able to control his campaign in 2012 or two, 2013, mainly because the platform had changed. So what we see here is the temporal um, differences between the 2006 and 2012 and 2013 campaign. Back here, 
in 20, uh, 2006, we don't see much coordination beyond the fact that they had a single candidate. For 2012 and 2013, that would change completely. So let's move on to the next block, 2007 to 2014. We're now in an intermediate uh, level of repression and high opposition coordination. These are key events that also trigger the need for creating a unity. I mean, for time constraints, I cannot walk through all the all the um, moves that Chavismo did over the uh, over the past years. But the referendum is an important one. In two thousand and seven, Chavismo tries to push for the indefinite re-election. Uh, re it loses and never publishes a result. Um, but the only the only thing that we know is that it loses. Uh, it also closes our um, RSTV, which is was back then Venezuela's oldest TV channel. Um, so another um, another signal that freedom of expression was not going to be guaranteed. In two thousand and nine, um, he goes actually for the indefinite um, re-election by a constitutional amendment. So ever since, um, all state powers can be re-elected in Venezuela. So what happens in 2009? We have the formal establishment of the opposition coalition. This is uh, Ramon Guillermo Valero. I couldn't find the picture with him. I'm really sad about it. It should be somewhere in my files. He said the following. We reached a consensus that we never had a chance if we competed separately. We understood that in order to win an authoritarian setting, a pact among parties was needed. So after all that happened over the past couple of years, the opposition comes together and sees the need um, to coordinate their actions. And it's not just coming together for the, same, for the sake of competing in elections. It's beyond that. It's coordinating across other sectors, which this um, quote kind of makes, um, makes clear. This is Honor Sonor, the current uh, MUD MP, and she's the vice president of Un Nuevo Tiempo. All opposition agreements prior to the MUD were strictly electoral. The only thing that mattered back then was to win elections. It did not matter whether we fought each other afterwards. But all of this changed with the MUD. It is our strategic alliance. It is not just an electoral alliance. So from then on, we'll see a change in strategy formation as well. And this, these are the examples. So in 2010, for the parliamentary election, the MUD launches the ticket for the first time. So it's not just selecting candidates uh, jointly, which they already did here for the same time. They also launch a party ticket. So this implies already a huge organizational um, effort. In 2011, we see primary elections for the selection of the 2012 presidential candidates. So again, another step forward in the coordination process. Let's remember them back in 2006, the only thing they did uh, was to come around uh, one presidential uh, candidate without the election, electoral dimension to it. So Gabriles wins. He's a member of uh, Primera Justicia. And I talked to him in 2016. And this is what he says. Look, the truth is that it is really hard to sit on one table with people you cannot stand. I don't want to do it, but I have to. How do you fight all state powers if you're divi divided? How do you win if the state is using all resources to create imbalances? We need to overcome our differences and fight this monster together. There's no other way. So what does that mean? And how does this presidential campaign compare to the previous one in 2006? Well, on many different levels. Now I've shown to you that they have a single candidate, which was elected through primaries. For the first time, we also see in Venezuela a common policy platform. So the opposition, despite their ideological differences, uh, I should say back then in 2012, this was a coalition of 30 parties ranging from the left to the right. They all came together around a centrist um, platform to confront Chavismo or Chavez actually in 2012. Um, we have new mobilization strategies called Casa por Casa, Pueblo por Pueblo. So each party, well, let's say the, the electoral geographics were kind of divided um, across party strength and each party campaigned for Capriles and for the MUD where they were um, stronger. They have shared resources. This means that larger parties like Primera Justicia, Acción Democrática, Unidad Popular, who have more um, material resources put in more on that end and smaller parties, maybe more you know, with volunteers or um, on 
regional um, uh, sectors where they were more um, when, where they were stronger. This time, we don't see a unitary ticket. That means that each opposition party supported the opposition candidate, but the MUD did not run for this election. This changes after Chavez dies. Apparently, in March 2015, there's this whole theory that he died before. Um, but the point is that in April, so only one month after he had died, um, there was another presidential campaign. And only within these couple of weeks, we see again a deepening of the coordination process. How? Well, we still have the single candidate like in 2012. We have a common policy platform. Um, this one was also redefined. The opposition presents a 100 days of uh, governance program where they, you know, they really want to uh, tell the voters that within the first couple of weeks and first couple of months, we're actually going to do a better job. We have an improved mobilization strategy. So, yes. Why do we see like so many Maduro faces? I'm, I'm going to come to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, we have improved mobilization strategy called Comando Familiar. So for the first time, the opposition borrows actually from the logic of the regime and induces their voters uh, to organize themselves. So let's say in a family, the head of the family would organize the voters and bring them to the polls. Or in, uh, let's say, neighborhoods, you would have one or two uh, people that will organize the voters, get them there. Um, for Chavismo, they call it el uno por diez. So one person would organize 10 voters. Um, and they'll get benefits. I mean, the opposition didn't off offer benefits, but the whole idea behind mobile um, uh, electoral mobilization is the one that they borrowed. They have shared resources, again, as they did previously, and for this time, we see a unitary candidate. So, uh, a unitary ticket, I'm sorry. So, this is the MUD ticket. No other um, opposition party ran this time. And why you have so many um, Maduro faces is because, um, so this is the... PSU, which is the uh, the government party, the incumbent, and then these are all um, smaller parties that were co-opted over time, left-leaning parties. And they all got added together, all right? So the Maduro's vote, yeah. you could vote for any of those yeah, yeah, yeah. satellite parties. Exactly. It'll go for, for Maduro. But they didn't yeah. do the same for the 30 other opposition yeah. parties. No. Less. Yeah. <laughs> but there are other faces there that are not Maduro. I mean, these are apparently other um, opposition candidates, but Smaller, right? yeah, and not really opposition. That's what the discourse is. So these are kind of co-opted, um, yeah, less um, or uh, co-opted um, weaker candidates, just to confuse the electorate as well. So this is another quote uh, from a strategist from ONAT, and he says the following. There has been loads of political relearning and professionalization within the opposition. The 2006, 2012, and 2013 campaigns vary so much, you can't even compare them. It seems like it's a complete different opposition each time. With time, we began to understand that we needed to invest more if we wanted to win. We needed to organize. We learned that Chavismo was changing with each electoral event. It was becoming authoritarian. So, as we've seen, uh, through the last two uh, presidential processes, the opposition did actually increase its coordination agreement. So what happens in 2014? The opposition calls for protest um, due to inflation, economic mismanagement, insecurity, shortages in food and medical supplies, high insecurity. And this time, well, one side throughout the opposition. Um, this time, the regime responds actually with violence. So during the protests that actually last for a couple of weeks and, and uh, actually more, like two to three months, over 40 people get killed um, between 2014 and 2016, which is a, a period of high conflict. Um, over 5,800 people um, get arrested for political reasons. Um, famous or well-known political leaders such as Leopoldo Lopez, um, Ledesma, Maria Corina Machado, were um, persecuted. Uh, Leopoldo is being sent was sentenced for 13 years. That is actually just escaped um, uh, two days ago. He's now in Madrid. And Maria Corina Machado was taken out of the game. She was disqualified from running for office. Um, and as of now, we see 380 political prisoners um, in Venezuela. This figure changed a lot, so I figured I'm just going to bring the newest ones. So what happens in 2015? After a period of high repression, 
we see actually the highest coordination um, on the opposition side for the 2015 parliamentary elections. Here, the MUD presents single candidates for all districts. They were either chosen by consensus or primary elections. We see a unitary platform, so the program was the same for everybody, which was worked out by the coalition. We have never seen this before in that way. So the presidential campaign, though our opposition participated in the design of the, of the platform, for this election, it was a unitary kind of umbrella uh, campaign that was designed. This is I MDD MP um, who said the following. This campaign was very well organized. This is this time we had an overarching theme. We all followed guidelines that the MUD worked out for us. Uh, and this is uh, Jesus Chuotorralla. I interviewed him in 2016. He was the second executive secretary of the coalition. And when I asked him about this process of designing um, the platform, he said the following. When the members of the MUD suggested I should monitor this campaign, I also asked them to let me manage the whole process and we professionalized the whole process. We incorporated technocrats and specialists, also sectors of the civil society. And these were not just consultants that were listened to if the members liked what they had to say. This time, they were the backbone of the process and everything we said we would do, we did. So they established um, mesas técnicas, so um, expert uh, roundtables who designed the discourse, who designed the platform for the campaign. And um, each of the candidates received the kind of a folder which all the steps uh, and the content they should uh, talk about during the campaign. Now, let's transition to C, 2016 and 2017, the last two years. We see high repression and we see lower opposition coordination. Why is that the case? Well, the opposition tries to go for a recall referendum in 2006 and it was denied. It was shut down um, by the regime. So we see that institutions are completely controlled and there is no way, no electoral exit anymore um, pushed by opposition parties. The uh, Tribunal Supremo de Justicia, so the Supreme Court, um, dissolves the National Assembly, which was um, elected in um, 2015 with a supermajority for the opposition, and it transferred all legislative powers to itself. So the opposition called this a coup um, in a way. So the parliament is out, the electoral body is out, the Supreme Court is out, and the sense they're all controlled by the regime. And there is also no facade anymore about this, right? So in previous years, maybe there was some doubt whether uh, the outcomes were going to turn always uh, in favor of the regime. But as of now, 2016, 2017, there's no doubt that everyone is partial. So the opposition responds with mass protests um, to ask for a change of the electoral management body and, uh, well, to call the regime to rethink its strategies of advancing towards full um, dictatorship. Again, the response is increased violence and increased persecution. Uh, over 130 people were killed during the protest um, this year. Uh, and Capriles, who was the central kind of opposition leader, is disqualified, is taken out of the game for 15 years. So what does the regime do? They desperately need a parliament, a parallel parliament, and this is what they call for a constituent assembly in July 2015, 2017. Um, it was unconstitutional because normally constituent assemblies were the ones that redraft the constitution. Um, for them to be activated, you got to ask the people if that's what they want through a referendum. And the Supreme Court and the uh, electoral management body both said that that wasn't necessary this time. So according to um, the electoral authority, over 8 million uh, citizens participated. This is quite problematic to believe because a government that has 83% or back in, in July, 83% uh, of a rejection is very, it's very difficult to mobilize 8 million uh, people in your favor. And, uh, and according to Smartmatic, who's the firm that runs um, the electronic vote, um, they said that there was clearly fraud. Because 8 million is about half of the electorate, right? Um, no, it's more. I mean, it's like around 
Uh, no, yeah, you're right. It's a Bauhaus. Yeah, I was thinking about the opposition. Um, okay, so the opposition, on the other hand, Hand, on the other hand, organizes a plebiscite. This is a non-binding kind of social mobilization um, strategy to show uh, that there, on the other hand, 7.6 million um, citizens are willing to, uh, you know, transition to democracy, and that they want to do it through the polls. So basically, the opposition called uh, the people to ask them, "Do you want to participate? Do you uh, reject? I'm sorry, do you reject the Constituent Assembly? Yes or no? And do you want to uh, transition um, uh, from this type of regime? Do you want elections? Yes or no? So this time here, there is no clientelism involved, right? There is no benefits for uh, the voters. Whereas here, um, Charisma again, as they do always. Well, this time the 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 highest good is food because of shortages. So they distributed a lot of uh, resources to get the people um, to vote for the constituent assembly. So in this context uh, of high conflict, and after apparently a success in the constituent assembly, the regime calls for regional election, which were due last year in December. So what do we see? We see the most uneven and unfair electoral process in Venezuela under uh, Chavismo. We have increased intimidation uh, and increased uh, gerrymandering right before, to, uh, 42, uh, 48 hours before the election. Um, the CNA, the electoral body, changed the electoral um, voting centers for over 2 million people, mostly opposition voters. So at the day of the election, Thousands of people didn't know where they had to vote, and of course, this was only uh, this targeted mostly um, opposition um, sectors. So the results are these: uh, Chavismo is in red, the opposition is in blue. Uh, the opposition wins five, and Chavismo wins eight governorships. After this, the opposition fragments. Why? Well, Acción Democrática and Nuevo Tiempo are now willing to take the oath before the Constituent Assembly. Now, let's recall, the Constituent Assembly is an, an unconstitutional mechanism called by the regime. It was not legitimized by national actors and also not by international actors. In fact, it was rejected by the whole international community. Now, for the opposition parties, the, the two that won the governorships in um, the regional elections, for them to assume office arbitrarily, the CNA said that they had to go before the Constituent Assembly to take the oath. Why is it the case? Well, they need legitimacy for the Constituent Assembly, right? So that makes sense. But what we see is that one party goes and take the oath. So four governors take the oath before the Constituent Assembly, and one decides to not do it. Which is the case of Voluntad Popular and Primera Justicia. And in the context of this fragmentation of uh, the opposition, the regime, uh, announces that it's going to go for municipal elections in December this year. So, I'm going to end with this quote. This is uh, Carlos Poparoni, he's an MUD uh, MP. And he says, what we're observing now is an opposition that is willing to coexist and please the regime, while the other part of the opposition is not willing to play this authoritarian game anymore. It's pretty obvious. There are clear individual interests behind these actions. So here he's referring to the parties that are willing to take the oath uh, before the Constituent Assembly. I'm going to wrap up. So what you should know when you leave this room is that electoral autocracies vary. Hybrid regimes vary a lot, and we need to look at the differences among them. I have suggested that repression is a proxy to understand on which um, end uh, a hybrid regime is located. And on top of that, you should also know that there is a curvilinear relationship between repression and opposition coordination. So at very low levels and high levels, we'll see no coordin coordination, but it is at intermediate levels that we'll see high opposition coordination. Now you may, may ask, well, Marinas may be doing a theory for Venezuela. I want to claim that that's not the case. Uh, I'm expanding, as Ken said, uh, onto the Mexican case, um, trying to understand whether the opening of the regime, whether that kind of process also affected the probabilities um, of coordination. That is, because the regime also opened up during the last uh, couple of decades, 
maybe the PAN and the PRD didn't have incentives to assume the costs of coordination. I'm going to leave it there, and I look forward to your comments. I think the primary question that I have is I'm seeing a correlation in the processes, but I'm not totally convinced that repression, variation and repression is driving uh, the, the process of coalition building. And I was wondering if you could talk about uh, how variables like political learning, and, and I see a lot of value in the idea that your institutional context matters for shaping mm -hmm. your strategy, right? Uh, but, but I'm wondering how dynamics within the opposition over time, and just poor decision making on their behalf over time, has co contributed to their rates of success or not, right? Like, what are they doing, and why is it just repression that is making them shift their strategy, or have they been trying to coalesce over time, but just continued failing and why? So two things there. Um, I'm looking at the coordination process, not whether the coordination process is successful or not. So competitiveness is, is sometimes argued to be a positive consequence of um, opposition coordination in hybrid regimes, but that's not the outcome that I'm interested in, in understanding. So because you said um, maybe they're just making poor decisions, that's why they maybe not they're not able to um, win. Continued failure. I think um, that definitely. Well, it depends on how we define the strategy that the opposition have pushed forward over the past seventeen years, whether we want to say that there are failures or not. I think that there's an interesting move, movement um, over the past 17 years. There was, I, I am truly convinced that it was triggered by the regime change, so by the nature of the regime. There's no incentives for, um, let's say, Leopoldo Lopez and Enrique Capriles to give up their um, candidacy or put their party uh, beneath the other one if it wasn't absolutely necessary. And we see that, for instance, um, after they won elections in 2015, you know, for a couple of months, each of the party thinks, uh, well, you know, now that we won, we might as well just go for it ourselves. But they can't. So uh, uh, Henry Ramos, who was, you know, being one of the most successful candidates during the first year because, you know, he was very aggressive and kind of challenging Maduro and people kind of wanted to see that. It's, it was his party who now took the oath um, in front of the Constituent Assembly. And just today, he declared that everyone needed to be in the coalition. Everyone. So why is that the case? And then he had, I should have actually played that video. He says, this is a dictatorship. Even if we hate each other, with other words, um, we have to sit on this table. So um, there might always been the discourse. Like, I guess what I'm, so I study Bolivia, mm -hmm. and in Bolivia, the opposition is also struggling to come together consistently, and they're consistently and constantly trying to come together, but they can't overcome kind of the leadership battles that mm -hmm. they have between them, right? So they all want to coalesce, but one of them always, each one of them always wants to be on top of that coalition, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but that doesn't take away from the fact that they, the discourse of wanting to coalesce has always been. Right, like mm -hmm. you interview them, and they're like, Yeah, you know, that the quote you showed of uh, before it was just an electoral strategy, and mm -hmm. now we really want to build a coalition. Come election time, they always have that, right? And you'll interview them, and they'll say, This time is for real, you know, we're doing <laughs> our primary elections, we're building a political movement, and then three weeks after the elections. Eh, it wasn't really working, so they like fall apart again, and then mm -hmm. like, ah. and then they're like, that was an electoral vehicle. We'll try it again next time. Um, so, has the issue, has the intent always been there? Is kind of my. I mean, I guess after interviewing, you know, over eighty 
politicians, um, of course, they all have individual interests, and they might not want to be in that coalition. They might want to, you know, go separately. This is the case of Maria Corina Machado. I mean, she's not able to run, so she like has this parallel kind of movement where she's trying to make some noise and and not go under under this uh, conditions because she has nothing to offer anymore in terms of political leadership because she was taken out. Um, discourse versus action. I mean, do they always mean it? I guess the case of Venezuela is a case of where, at the end of the day, they do mean it because they have no other option. I also think that Bolivia and Venezuela are very different scenarios, right? I mean, well, we'll see what happens now uh, in Bolivia and where the regime will be transitioning to. But the stakes are not as high as in Venezuela. I mean, political mistakes of the nature of back in the early 2000s are very costly at this point. In Venezuela, because if this is another six year, I mean, now it's not even clear whether after this presidential election is supposed to take place next year, there will be any other presidential election. So it's this time, or we don't know. And now look at the look at the profiles. Henry Ramos is seventy five or something. Enrique Gabriles is forty something. Uh, Leopoldo as well, and he can't even run. Ledesma, well, he's now exiled. He can't run either but he's in his early 70s so this has personal costs as well they need to win which will make them also more likely i think to sit in that coalition because even if you know enrique or lopolo whoever this is going to be the candidate they will have ministries and one is going to be the vice president and so the whole situation is going to be um by far improved um if there is a regional transition Thanks, uh, Marian. It was a great presentation. I think also that you have great uh, quotes and great interviews, great data. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, so, building on Mariana's question, mm -hmm. um, can, can, can it be the case that after 2015, when the opposition won the majority of the parliament, that they saw that, that the next election was the, was the governor's, more like executive type of elections, and the next one is the presidency. So that is not really the case of the repression that is driving their fragmentation, but really their own ca ca calculations of their own benefits that they, they want to win. They want every party within the opposition wants to be the one leading the transition to democracy. Let's say. And actually, I think the last quote that you mentioned, that you showed, and you go, go back, like a little bit supports this idea that is, they, they went back, not in your idea, the scenario C was about survival, right? That's why they fra fragment, right? But your scenario A is about personal or individual uh, gains, mm -hmm. right? That's what mm -hmm. causes the fragmentation. But then this quote is, I think it's, it builds on the the scenario of internal competition within the the, the, the opposition. Yeah, the, the individual interest behind these actions. So maybe it's just mm -hmm. exploring another avenue here. Maybe it's, it, it could be, or I don't know, it's my one your opinion. Maybe, what are the the parts that are not explained by the nature of the of the repression, but just on the elections, on the institutional rules that are in front of them. And, and the second question is related to the regime opposition, incumbent opposition actions. In your story is always the regime acting first and then the opposition. But the story of Chavismo is also a story of opposition, the opposition, opposi elites or parties acting in horrible ways against the regime too, right? Uh, so you had the, you mentioned a little bit of the political coup in, the coup in 2002, the strikes on 2003, when Chavez was, be before the election of Chavez, they elected the, the Congress so they will have more chance. They, they also changed the institutional rules to favor their own chances. So it's not 
I mean, the image that you show or you portray is more like the opposition, the regime repressing the opposition, and the opposition just acting uh, as a reaction, right? But maybe it's also the other way around, and the story goes back to to the election of Chavez. Okay, so I, I guess in the last the the last one is rather a comment than than a question. Yeah. No, I want, I want to hear from you. Yeah. What I think about it? No, that, that it's not in your story. It's more about mm -hmm. regime repressing, and then the, the the opposition reacts. But what what if, what if the arrow also goes in the other direction? That the regime there is a story here of the regime also reacting to the opposition. Okay, so my first um, thought about it, about that is that <clears throat> there's no way <clears throat> you can justify moving towards authoritarianism only because um, the opposition is trying to get you out. I mean, I agree with the no, coup. In, the, in, the, in a normative sense or in a causal sense? In a normative sense, yeah, you can justify it, but... I mean, it's it's true. The opposition made a lot of mistakes, and, and I mentioned it during the first um, slides. That doesn't justify that the regime moves towards authoritarianism. And yes, you're right in the sense that the opposition might have some leverage in, um, you know, acting in a way. Um, but it is the government who has the control of institutions and over state forces. So in that sense, um, you know, the opposition cannot cannot do anything about it if the electoral uh, calendar is being manipulated. There's I mean, there's room for action in the sense that you can call for protests, etc., but you cannot really um, set the agenda in in authoritarian regimes. And I guess even to some extent in, in in democracies. I mean, yes, I agree that the regime can also react towards the opposition. I think we saw that in 2014, 2015, 2016, where the opposition called for protests, and then you see uh, a strong reaction, and you see actually also... Uh, and move towards authoritarianism when um, the popular uh, popularity of Maduro goes down and the opposition has more strength. I will I will think about it whether that has an effect on on my explanation. And the first one, um, you wonder whether this scenario is rather B that, that, than that the fragmentation C. that we mm -hmm. see after 2015. It's not C, but it's actually A, and it's explained by not by higher repression, but actually just not need, not bad decisions, but actually just competition within these organizations that are within the the opposition. They are. I would agree. Want to lead the the next. They want to be. The I, I agree. I would agree if this was um, a democratic context, but it's not. So this is now a full authoritarian regime where it doesn't even make sense anymore whether you win elections or not. Why? Because once you win an institution, say the parliament, it's stripped off its competences. It cannot do anything. Once you win governorships, you'll have parallel um, governorships where the resources go to. So once um, the opposition has won, let's say, a municipality or has won a governor, um, a, a region, say Miranda, this was the case of Enrique, uh, he didn't get the resources anymore to pay um, his employees. He didn't get resources to um, finance projects. He was actually stripped off the competences of security, health, and education. So you're basically left with nothing. So what is the point of having a... Um, a governorship that is not going to get you anywhere in the first place. No? So that's why I don't agree that we're back in A. I think that here um, what they're trying to do is somehow these uh, regional actors, um, the governors, um, they of course want to perform because now they're thinking like, okay, everyone's going under. I might at least just have, I mean, this is an empty governorship, but at least it's something. No? Um, so, but I will think about it. I'm not. I'm not sure convinced because this is the most authoritarian election that we've uh, we've seen. It's the most manipulated. So even winning under these conditions and knowing that you will not be able to govern is not going to get you um, the executive seat to the presidency. Yeah, or to govern. Yeah, I'm coming from a historian's point of view. So, um, you know, the question that comes to mind, of course, like you know, and also sort of the traditional black people, so excited, of course, so about Chavez. 
But so the question I have is about um, the social class origin. So I'm thinking more from a Marxian point of view or a methodology. So what I'm sort of intrigued by is whether these, all the coalition parties that are represent the opposition, whether they all represent a similar social class, or do you feel like it really is a, a representative of the raw spectrum of social classes in Venezuela? Uh, and I ask that question because, of course, the regime, especially at first, made it a point of pride of being, you know, represented Pueblo. Um, and all the programs that they put uh, in place at first were, you know, to serve the people, with the food, uh, banks, and the housing initiatives and all of that. So, sort of stepping away a little bit from the actual um, party institution, what I'm wondering is, what is the connection between the party and the people? I guess it's kind of where I'm getting at. And again, I'm coming from a historian's point of view, so I'm interested in the connections that exist between social groups and party, not just the party itself. I think this is a, a super interesting question. Go, it, it goes a little bit beyond um, my work. So a lot of a couple of things come up when um, when you talk about that. So one question is: Do pe do the people, whoever that is, feel represented by the alliance? So that is: Do we have a kind of mixed um, political class emerging under this coalition? I mean, they claim to be. The truth is that for a long time, um, there was some sort of variation and, and regional parties like Causa R, you know, they're more stronger in, in El Estado Bolívar, for instance. So you have local leaders that are emerging um, that come from such different um, class sectors. But on the other hand, it is very obvious that, let's say, Maria Corina Machado, Leopoldo Lopez, Enrique Capriles, these are kind of, or were at some point, um, privileged um, socioeconomic classes that at some point decided to um, participate in politics. That's one thing. The other thing is, um, what's the connection between the coalition and the people? I think it's probably, the situation in Venezuela right now is so bad in so many different terms that the people, all they want is for these guys to leave because it didn't work out. So party affiliation if that's what we're getting at, if this is what we want to measure, is really low at this point. Um, so it's really just a, it's a context of a high conflict, of a lot of problems, economic mismanagement, high poverty. Uh, you know, 85% of Venezuelans are only eating once a day. So at this point, um, I feel party affiliation or membership is not as important. And of course, I mean, it's interesting to find out whether voters really are associated with the MUD in terms of program and, and you know, ideas, etc., or if they're voting for them as a, as a punishment, no, voto castigo. It's really interesting. I wanted, I wanted to do a survey and I want to bring the voters into my thesis, but it, the data is just not, it's not going to be, it's not going to be great. I, I think that this is going to be an issue to look back to from the future on. So maybe in like a couple of years, it'll be interesting to look at uh, class divisions um, again. But at this point, I think it's very complicated. Okay, Thank you.